Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and I'm so thrilled today to be joined by the wonderful Lauren Lyle to talk all about her TV show, Karen Peary. And I wanted to start by talking a little bit about when you were going through the audition process, because once you got the call back and had a couple more scenes, um, I know that you spent a lot of time having friends do read throughs with you and really just exploring a lot of different directions in which you could take the scenes. And yeah. so I was interested in how that that process and going into the callback really helped you to cement the idea of who this character was and also the delivery that you wanted to land on going back into an audition space because there's always so many different ways that you could play any scene especially when you don't have the full scripts yet yes so I mean yeah when I first got the scripts uh, it was there was so much police jargon that I had to do and sort of being an actor in your 20s is not very often you get to be asked to do a lot of police jargon so I had to be really smooth doing it I was like, she has to be quite cool even though she's like a bit of a weird character and she's a bit odd and like marches around and where's Doc Martens. I think she still needs to be like slick at her job and cool. And so I called loads of my friends before and made sure that they ran the scenes with me so that I could be really slick with it all. Um, and then, yeah, once so then I was able to do it like a load of different ways, which is fab going in. And then when it actually came to being on set, Gareth, our director was fab. He was really, um, I don't know, he just very trusting. I felt very trusted to do what I wanted to do. And he had loads of different ideas. And mainly the thing he said was, if I've cast it right, then we're good. We're okay. So you can kind of be free to do what you want to do. Um, there were a few things like, I mean, I remember walking in on my first day on set and I have a cartilage piercing. And we were like, should we put her in a cartilage piercing? And he was like, Lauren, you're Karen Perry, that like, you decide that side of things. I'll do big picture. <laughs> I was like, okay. So I got to do some creative control things, which is fab. And I, and I was able to decide what she looked like and how she sounded. But yeah, generally speaking, going from the audition side of things into how it was on set, um, Gareth just kept saying, if he cast it right, we were okay. So I was allowed to really play around with what I wanted to do and how differently to do it and I mean, when you have another actor in front of you, it completely changes things and you have to respond to what they're doing. And it's I, I, I like to say it's sort of responding. You're not reacting. You have to respond and be with them and do it together. Um, I, like, I hate it when actors think that it's like all on them and when it's their coverage, they'll do one thing. And then when it's your coverage, they'll do something else because inevitably the minute you guys start to do things, it changes one another's performance and... I've had actors do that to me. And then when it's turned around on them, they've gone, oh, can, can you just do it? Can you do it a bit like this? And I've been like, see, you do need me to do something that works with us together. So let's do it together. Let's like work it out and, what, and decide what we want to do. So that was a real pleasure. We had a lot of amazing, amazing actors um, who were really up for collaborating and changes the whole kind of thing from page to screen. And also when you first started filming the show and were filming around the cathedral setting at the beginning of, of filming, I know that there were some police officers that were there as escorts and, and in particular one woman that you saw as being very much like a version of Karen that you switched numbers with. And, and so I was really fascinated by what some of the things were that you really saw in her or kind of talked to her about and how that really helped to cement certain choices that you were making character wise at the same time. Yeah, great research you've done. <laughs> Um, yes. So when we were filming in St. Andrews, I decided uh, it was my first night kind of going down to set. And it was the first time I'd got a chance uh, to sort of assert myself and be a woman in film. I decided I was going to be a woman in film that goes down and goes, this is my show. I'm going to see what's going on. Um, so I went down to the cathedral and that's where we were shooting that night. And we had two police officers on guard um, at the spot because it's kind of a protected area and it was quite late at night. And one of them was sort of small, blonde, my age build. And I was like, okay, I need to go talk to you. And I went over to her and was like, hi, you're a police officer. How does that feel? Being looking like you do and being the way you are. And she was like, yeah, I mean, well, what do you want to know? And she gave me some really cool insights sort of around what she would wear so she was in full uniform and she talked a lot about how that was her armor and when she took that off it really felt like taking off armor and it felt like taking off a persona and when you do wear it it is like a persona and it is a different person that you become um and she talked a lot about how I sort of said you know do, do the men like do big men ever give you hassle and she said yeah they do a lot but quite often sometimes if they're like 
we're the, the drunks and things, they'll be quite nice to the women and they'll just actually find it quite funny. And that in turn can be quite annoying because you feel patronized. Um, and so she talked a lot about how like weapons and stuff, having them on her, when she'd take them off at the weekends, she really became someone else. So it was quite a useful, helpful thing to hear. And then I said to her, oh, are you from St. Andrews then, where we were filming? And she said, no, no, I'm from Methyl, which is the exact tiny, tiny, tiny town that Karen is from. And like, it's like no one's, hardly anyone's from Methyl. Like, it's like pretty unusual you'd come across it. We were in the East Coast of Scotland. And I was like, oh my God, you're the real Karen Pity. Um, and then eventually I did say to her, do you want to sort of move up? She was a, D, um, a DC and Karen's a DS. I said, do you want to move up? And she was like, no, I quite like going out on the weekends and having a good time. And I was like, oh, okay, like maybe that's where we differ. But um, her name was Dana. She was really cool. We have her number. She was going to give me a wee ride along, but um, COVID meant we couldn't go into the police station. But hope if we go again, I would do it. I love that. And, and especially what you're saying there about the the uniform really being an armor. Um, and did that influence some of the choices that you ended up making alongside Leslie Abernathy, who's the costume designer on the show? Because again, that sounds like a place where you had a lot of autonomy and a lot of say in certain choices. And, and I love the fact that it's, you know, this woman in, in a man setting and kind of trying to fit in, but through that, having her very own kind of like quirky style, you know, even with like the popped collar and it feeling very much like yeah. a of armor. Yeah. So, um, Exactly. We, when I stepped on, um, Leslie and I were basically just told she can't be fashionable. She doesn't really understand clothes. She doesn't look cool. She doesn't really wear suits properly. The book talks about her wearing ill-fitting like men's suits and things. And I kind of when I started reading all that in the books and the scripts hadn't given much to what she looked like intentionally, sort of trying to steer away from what women should have to look like. And um I really love the idea of actually some of the things being described that weren't meant to be fashionable are quite fashionable and that she's a bit accidentally cool. And I had a thing where well, Val really wanted her to have a bag, wanted her to have a bag. I really fancied the idea of her having some sort of bag, but I didn't want it to be a backpack. She already looks quite young and I didn't want her to, I also didn't want to like on set be running around with something big and heavy to sort of deal with in scenes. Um, it would just be too cumbersome. So I had said to Leslie, what about a bum bag? Because um, a lot of people my age nowadays will wear them across your front. And I was like, but what if she wears it like the proper way you're supposed to wear it? And like right around the front. And Leslie was like, okay, Patagonia, we'll, we'll, we'll give them a call. So we got like big up Patagonia now, who are the most relevant, cool company saving the world. But um, we've now got a relevant Patagonia bum bag going on. And then I really just like the idea of her having like sweater vests or something, trying to fit in with these men around her and trying to sort of stand up and level up to the guys, but in turn sort of isolating herself and, um, and not really becoming a bit of an alien towards all of them and them sort of looking at her like, what earth is she wearing? And in Scotland, you also pop a collar sometimes. So I was like, that's a nice ode to Scotland. So... Leslie and I put all the clothes on. She got some great car heart. It's quite kind of androgynous workwear. And we put it all on in production straight away. We're like, nah, it looks too cool. She looks too cool. So I said, okay, well, just let me like video me walking around the office as Karen. And I'll like pick up some boxes and I like going out telling people what to do and like marched around as Karen would. And then I came back and we sent the videos to production and straight away they came back with them. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, great. She's not cool at all. It's fat. Let's go. <laughs> so we got the sign off. So me and Leslie really worked together with like various ideas and we did loads of mood boards and references. And it was the first time I got proper, proper creative control around a character and really got to decide who she was and what she looked like and bring her into sort of the modern age a bit as well. That's amazing. And I also wanted to ask a little bit about the use of music and in getting into character, because I've heard you mention artists like Tressa and Wolf Alice that you were listening to a lot and having a whole Spotify playlist for this character. Um, and is that something that's very much like a pre-production thing? Are you using certain sounds for certain scenes? And is that something that was specific to this project? Or is that something that always helps you in terms of stepping into characters? I quite often use music. Um I mean, I've done certain things before we've, so, I mean, often it's really useful when you're doing something very dark to sort of take yourself away and put your headphones on and block everything out and listen to some things to get you in the, in the mood and in the zone. Um, I, with this, it was a lot of energy. Like I had to have so much energy the whole time. I was in almost every scene in the whole show and leading something. There is really something about a responsibility that comes with being number one in the call sheet and 
having to like command a set a little bit and have the energy of bringing positivity to a set when everyone else is coming in and out of it quite regularly. So a lot of it was getting up in the morning, having a great playlist to like get myself up to and then like really focus with and put myself in a good mood so that then I could really be concentrated for the rest of the day. Um, things like Wolf Alice and whatnot, yeah, I've spoken about that before. They were so useful just because they're like really like hardcore, quite grungy, like meaningful, like make your heart beat songs. Um, and that really helped me. I actually told Ellie, I met Ellie, um, the lead singer of Wolf Alice. I bumped into her at Fashion Week this week. We sat in the front row of a show together. And I was like, oh my God, I've just been talking about you, saying that I can never answer the question, what parts is like the dream part to play? And I was saying, um, if anyone now asked me, quite often I've just watched you at Glastonbury again. And it would be that. It would be like being the front woman of a band, of a rock band, and like playing to Glastonbury for 800,000 people and then doing the story of what it means to be the front woman of a rock band. Um, and she was laughing. But there is like a kind of power in that. It's like quite a cool thing to watch. Um, and then I had things like Fred again um, and loads of different Tresser, loads of different cool um artists that are quite kind of electronic music I got into quite a lot which is quite upbeat um and yeah I think I had to do quite a lot of stuff on my own sometimes and Karen really had to sort of I had to be very focused on who she trusted and who she didn't trust and who had died and who hadn't died and who do, who do I know has done something at this point who do I know hasn't given the timeline um so I had to be quite focused most of the time you couldn't really drop the ball and, and with what you were just mentioning about needing to always be very clear, okay, is this someone that she trusts? Does she believe what they're saying? Is she suspicious? Is she trying to, you know, pull certain information out of them? Um, I wanted to ask about the the part of your process where you essentially had your own wall for the case at home with like things written all over the yeah. show so that you could really get in depth and understand the case from your own perspective outside of the show. Um, and how did that help you in terms of just kind of referencing that a lot and being so in depth with it when it came to creating scene interactions with the other actors and just like you said really going in with an emotional understanding of where your character is at and how she's reading someone yeah totally I had to do it like when I first got the scripts in there were so many different characters the three boys were like a big thing at the beginning um Tom Mackey Ziggy and um Alex and the three of them, Tom is called weird half the time and half the time he's called Tom. And I remember when I was reading it, I was like, which one's Tom? Which one's weird? Which one's Ziggy? Oh my God. And I had to just write their three names out, what they looked like, the characteristics, what they had done, where they were to where their lives had gone. And then it was like, right, they're one. And then it came to like everyone, the podcaster, every other suspect that then comes up. And then it comes down to at what point the like who dies, who doesn't die, who I trust and who's not done anything. And then because we wouldn't always shoot in order. So I did have a, in the end a big sort of wall in my apartment of um of the case of like walking in to, just to remind myself like every day walking in who I was interrogating. Do I know what they've done or do I not? And if I do know what they've done, it was quite fun to then play with it and get to sort of. I mean, I'd done a show video where I was being interrogated in that show. So to be able to not do the things that I did in that and try and be really slick and Karen's got to be very cool and calm and um, be able to read people really quietly. She does a lot of listening. And then she's got to like tumble out the information that she's taken in and like catch them out. So I had to look like I knew I was, I was doing that, which in the end I was like in the end I could talk you through it all but I remember how confused I was at the beginning to where we were now where we are now and um and Emer as well she was so on hand the writer so I'd call her we would like I'd be calling her at like 11 o'clock at night so we'd get home from set and I'd be like so about tomorrow's scene and she'd be like you have to say it this way okay I've done 12 drafts so it would just be a big process it was like three four months of like incredibly intense process I did nothing else I had to navigate my evenings in silence when I'd come home and just cook and learn lines and listen to music. 
And with the interrogation scenes, I always think that's such a fascinating exercise because there's so many different types of spaces that you have to try and create for the other character. You know, sometimes she's really trying to create this openness so that someone feels comfortable opening up and she's not suspicious of them. And sometimes she's kind of intentionally trying to make someone feel very on edge so that they'll trip up and reveal something that they maybe didn't intend to. Um, and so how did you work on on character wise how you wanted to create those different types of spaces in interrogation scenes where like you said as well there's the added element of it being a lot of listening as well so it's not necessarily forthcoming with dialogue yeah well I think a lot of it would be things like having them knowing that they had to get everything out so you'd like really make them sweat so there's certain ones where I knew Karen was supposed to not trust them, despite the fact the audience probably knew they were maybe innocent or I knew. The hardest thing was knowing who's done it and having to hide that the whole time and suspect other people. So you'd look for all the, like, where me and Gareth would have a lot of conversations where he'd highlight, you know, so-and-so has done this and they've done that and imagine she's realised this about them and to the police, this looks really dodgy. So you would almost see everyone as guilty and that would normally be the best bet. It was really fun to have like big guys in front of me on interrogations and being allowed to sort of snike at them and give them snide comments. And if they got really riled up, that was quite fun for Karen to be able to sit back. There felt like real gravitas in that. More often than not, I would go to like a place of sitting back and letting them sweat and panic. Um rather than playing the card of like I'm I'm don't know what I'm doing and I'm a young woman underestimated like I think the whole time that's sitting under the surface for her but she's really trying to push push past that and um and just um remain calm and remain collected and and on it uh so it was fun and also there's something like we talked about where when it comes to interrogations, quite often in these police dramas, you've got like a, a, a sergeant, like a, a real top, top dog doing the interrogations. And that's just not realistic. Like they would have a young detective like Karen doing all the interrogations up until a much later stage. So a lot of the time, like if people were going, it's just so funny watching someone so young do this, we'd be able to turn around and say, well, this is this is exactly what happens actually. Um, it's just not often portrayed on screen. And that that calmness that you mentioned in the character as well is such an interesting facet as well, because in essence, you're playing a character where the audience need to have a window into how she's feeling, how she's responding to things. But yet you can't give that away to other characters in so many moments. You know, there's a moment where she's in real danger and she has to be incredibly cool, calm and collected. And yet as the audience, we can still sense, you know, the nervousness, the fear, her kind of trying to think five steps ahead to figure out how she's going to get move forward through the situation. Um, you know, the interrogation scenes of not giving her own emotions or her own responses. And so how do you go into scenes throughout a show where that is the unique challenge of it in, in terms of expressing something, but not being able to give it to any character in the scene? I think it's almost twofold where you get a lot of Karen when she's at home and she's with River or she's on her own and it's quite personal and it's like she lets go a little bit and you see the youthfulness of her and you see the panic and you see the like terror and knowing that she's the one that has to figure it out and not being sure how to do that. And then the other side of things being it's such a personal case for her. She's another young woman that knows what it means for a young woman to be scared and not know what it means to to be safely walking home at night. And everything for her comes from a really personal, going to the right thing place for her. I mean, the the whole drive is justice for Rosie doing whatever she can and doing whatever she needs to do to get there. And like in that, I think I know what you mean in that um, particular bit where she's in danger, she knows this is such a personal thing and it's so personal to her as well that um, this terrible thing can happen to women and she's one of these women that it could have happened to and she knows what it feels like to have to have been told to put your keys between your fingers at night. So I think that sort of real, actual real relatability we haven't seen before on screen and I think it's really cool to explore it and see it from such a um, normal perspective of someone that could deal with it themselves and then paired with she is young and she is just a person and we have to see that side of her in order to connect with her and to believe her and to like vide and, and bide for her and um, 
I don't know, I think it's really cool and important to get a chance to see it. So I think all of that you get trickles of. And then when she's in an interrogation room or when she's at work, you then see the surface of like having to keep it together and the professional side of it. And it almost makes it all the more interesting to watch that you know all that's going on underneath and the struggles she is having, but she can't admit it at all. Um, it's not like some... I don't know, middle-aged detective who's like going through a divorce as they always are and like has a bottle of beer in his hand because he's can't deal with his own life. And then he's also got to solve the case on top. Like she's quite hungry and excited and ready and 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 needs to do it and knows that it's uh, so not just about Rosie, it's about all these other women and all these other people that need her um, and need it to be done properly. Uh, and if she could just get all the like old guys out of the way, it would all be a lot more useful. Not even the old ones, even the mint. He's quite annoying at times as well. We love him in the end, but he's he's also like running around in his Ted Baker suits, needing to go to the gym more than he is to solve the case at the beginning until he sort of Karen kicks him up the ass a little bit. <laughs> and and with that personal connection that she has to the case and just kind of understanding that experience as a woman and, and the real passion and drive, did you always have a sense going into her as a character of, of how she would respond to the mounting pressure? Because it's the pressure of there's public perspective on this case. There's also the community and the fact that this is 25 years of, of personal grievances that have festered. Um, and so there's a lot of elements that are much deeper because of that. And as things really mount and get tighter and closer and there's more pressure, um, how did you navigate finding how you wanted her to respond to that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's what gives it a lot of pressure and that's what gives it a lot of um, 2021, 22 relatability. Ema was really aware of um, the world and how it is now. And the book was originally written in 2004. So it was quite a different world, lots of the same issues. But nowadays, things like social media putting a lot of pressure on the police and uh, the public being allowed to actually be quite involved in having a comment and having an opinion about these sort of things that are going on now, that all becomes incredibly relevant and necessary to do and to use. I mean, even having like a podcast as the arc and as the tool to which you move and drive the story forward, having a podcast myself, having you having a podcast yourself, it's, I know it's such an effective way to reach people. It's such an effective way to drive and create an audience and build a community. And so using that and bringing it into this world felt really necessary and it really helped tell the story in a much more putting it in your home, in your living room kind of way. I think everyone's been aware of what's been happening in the world for the last, well, at least the last few years, with a lot of women in the media going missing and being murdered and just not go, just not getting home at night and that being it um so I think Emer and I found it really important to sort of push that forward and Emer wrote into it a lot to make sure that that was seen and heard and it makes me feel quite good maybe the fact that it's on quite mainstream channels that people that might not otherwise have engaged with that sort of story and that sort of subject may I don't know, learn something is not maybe not learn something, but, you know, engage with it and see something they wouldn't have otherwise seen and how normal it is and how much more there is to be done, um, which feels good. That feels good to be able to do that and say something meaningful. And with the fact that it is this this very realistic but also very gritty subject matter at the heart of it, I think one of the things that the Ema and you have crafted really beautifully into this character and into the show is also allowing moments for lightness and allowing this comedy, you know, like you mentioned the dynamic with Mint where like he'd rather be at the gym or he's like, oh, yeah. the evidence room is scary. And she's like, <laughs> you know, I think you can handle it. And so yeah. you have these kind of like comedic deliveries. And so how did you find the tone of, of balancing those two sides where it never felt like it was detracting from the subject matter, detracting from the story that you're telling and the way that you're telling it, but still allowing the audience these moments of reprieve and, and also just this deeper connection with a character and making her more fully fledged by having that aspect yeah we were so aware of it we were so aware of it's, we can't make it funny we can't make light of what is a very dark subject matter and nor did we want to do that it was about exactly as you say letting everyone into these characters and having them fall in love with these characters and therefore sticking with them and really vying for them to do well um, and so we always knew that Gareth would come in quite a lot and say, you know, next, what we'll have in the script or what we'll be cutting to next is this particular thing. So you need to go into it and need to end the scene with like paying homage or like at least honouring that so that we know to move in slowly. 
Um, but there is also a thing of using levity. We all use it. We all, it's, it's not comedy, but we all use humor and levity to cope with dark things and, and difficult things that happen in the world. And I think you often laugh at things on screen because you relate to them and you kind of go, oh my God, that's like my life. Like that's what I would do in that situation. That's so funny. Someone else has done that. And so that's really what we're sort of trying to do. And you need people to connect with these characters and you need them to jump on board and be with them. And people are weird and people are funny. And it's that that we're we're sort of laughing at. It's not the story. It's not the subject matter. Because, I mean, something that I found I really had to be careful with and I think was pretty all right. The, the reviews say it's been okay, but is jumping between the sort of real seriousness of what we're doing and then also landing a bit of a joke on like who they are as people who Karen and Mint are as a relationship and keeping it really dry and keeping it really natural and smooth and this is just who she is and quite often Karen's just laughing at how ridiculous a lot of this world has been built to be and how unnecessary so much of like the pomp and ceremony of the conservative police force is like it's, I always find it really funny walking in and the men stood up when she walks in to shake her hand and she's kind of going, why is everyone standing up? Just like, let's get into it. Um, and they're all wearing ties and we've got to wear a tie to work and it's going, okay. And like she, just seeing it through her eyes of this young person that's really naturally good at her job and doesn't need to do all that. And actually I think is how a lot of us look at the world going, we just don't need all that, um, is really sort of satisfying, I think. And also, again, you haven't seen it. Like we were always thinking, of, what's the difference between this police drama and any other and I think it is this youthful fresh new take on how we look at the world and a bit of a sarcastic um I don't know guise of it and that she's just trying to move forward and do it and it's all these hurdles that come in her way and it's quite funny trying to bat them all down as well as landing how serious it is what she has to do I mean I, I think you did such such a wonderful job with that it's such a great character and such a fantastic performance so congratulations on everything with the series and thank you so much for thank you no thanks so much it's been lovely to chat to you thanks <laughs>